you will know from your previous study of his other plays that Shakespeare likes to tackle difficult questions to ask us to think about our own values and the way we live our lives. His treatment of religion in Hamlet is much less straightforward than other plays and reflects the confusion that surrounded the changing approaches to and understanding of religion in 16th century Europe. Shakespeare uses this spiritual confusion to ask us questions about good and evil and the way we live our lives. Firstly, let's quickly recap what we know about religion in Shakespeare's context. Broadly speaking, Hamlet was written during the Elizabethan era, and English society and their understanding of morality was dominated by Christianity. You will remember from our lesson on context that people believed that world order was created through the great chain of being. This means that power and authority flow from God at the top to the king or queen who is God's representative on earth. The foul and most unnatural murder of the rightful King Hamlet is such an abhorrent crime that it throws the kingdom into chaos. Shakespeare shows us the chaotic nature of Denmark when Hamlet uses the extended metaphor in Act 1, Scene 2 to describe the world as an unweeded garden. Worse than just being a mess of overgrown plants, he goes on to describe that it is full of things rank and gross in nature. In other words, it is full of rotting and poisonous plants. The image of the garden links back to the scene of the crime. Old King Hamlet was murdered by his brother Claudius as he slept in the royal orchard, a setting that should symbolise goodness and nurture, but instead has been turned into a site of evil. The image also draws on another key religious image, the biblical Garden of Eden. The murder thus parallels the fall of man in the Bible as Eve is tempted by the serpent in the Garden of Eden and she and Adam are ultimately thrown out of the garden to fend for themselves in the cruel and evil world. Similarly, Claudius's sin has led to the fall of Denmark. The appearances of the ghost also reminds us of the confusion that surrounded Christianity in Shakespeare's time. Remember that it wasn't all that long ago that England split from the Catholic Church and the Protestant Reformation mounted serious challenges to Catholic theology. In a nutshell, lots of people still weren't quite sure which were the right religious rules to follow, which makes things difficult if you want to live a righteous life and end up in heaven. Now, remember how the guards were scared out of their wits at the appearance of the ghost in Act 1, Scene 1? They called it a dreaded sight. It even terrifies the brave Horatio, who says, It harrows me with fear and wonder. They're spooked because a good Christian should go to heaven for all eternity after they die. According to Protestant theology, the appearance of a ghost must be the evil work of the devil, as it is clearly the spirit of someone who was not pure enough to be let into heaven. Ouch! Shakespeare shows us that the guards suspect as much when Horatio invokes the power of heaven, commanding the ghost, By heaven I charge thee, speak! He metaphorically compares the appearance of the ghost to a volcanic eruption, saying, This bodes some strange eruption to our state, to reinforce the idea that the play is going to explore some difficult questions about the nature of good and evil. As the play progresses, Shakespeare explores how difficult it is to navigate the path between good and evil as he introduces ideas from Catholic theology regarding the origins of the ghost. When Hamlet finally meets the ghost of his father, we find out that old King Hamlet is experiencing a form of purgatory, which, according to the Catholic faith, is a place where spirits who are not pure enough to enter heaven go to be temporarily punished and purified before joining God. In Act 1, Scene 5, the ghost uses hellish imagery when he tells Hamlet that he must return to sulphurous and tormenting flames. but. Rather than joining Satan in hell, he is only suffering for a certain term, till the foul crimes done in my days of nature are burnt and purged away. This is the Catholic idea of purgatory, 
He is not actually in hell, but is receiving temporary punishment for his sins before he can go to heaven. The ghost seems to be doing the right thing by warning Hamlet of the consequences of giving in to sin. But if we look closer, Shakespeare is doing something else as well. When the ghost urges Hamlet to revenge his foul and most unnatural murder by killing Claudius, he is essentially asking his son to commit murder, which is a terrible sin. However, he tells Hamlet not to hurt his mother, rather, leave her to heaven, or the judgment of God. So, Shakespeare leaves us to question whether the ghost is an agent of good, warning Hamlet of the pain of purgatory, or an agent of evil, tempting Hamlet into terrible sin. After all this heavy thinking, Shakespeare does give us a bit of reprieve in Act 3, Scene 3. Shakespeare sets Claudius up as a clear example of sin. Let's think of this scene as an example of how not to behave. Through a soliloquy, a speech that lets the audience hear a character's innermost thoughts, Claudius tells us his problems with prayer as he struggles to repent for his many terrible sins. He begins using olfactory imagery, or the sense of smell, to explain the magnitude of his sin, admitting, My offence is rank, it smells to heaven. Furthermore, he compares his own fratricide, or murder of his brother, to the biblical story of Cain, who murdered his brother Abel in a jealous rage. He says his action hath the primal eldest curse upon a brother's murder. Killing your brother is one of the oldest sins in history. So far, it seems like a textbook confession until he gets to the part where he must ask for forgiveness. Here, he realises that he can't do this because he is still enjoying all the great things he has gained since murdering his brother. He lists them as my crown, mine own ambition, and my queen. He then uses a rhetorical question to get to the heart of the matter. Claudius asks, may one be pardoned and retain the offence? In other words, he knows that he can't ever ask for forgiveness for his sin because he doesn't want to give up what he has gained from the murder. He reveals that he cannot repent his sins, even though he acknowledges how evil this makes him, exclaiming, O wretched state! O bosom black as death! Shakespeare touches on a really human struggle between what we know to be right and how good some sinful actions can feel. Claudius is caught in a bind between the repentance he knows he should feel and his desire to retain his ill-gotten gains. While Claudius tries to pray, Hamlet enters, about to kill his uncle and exact his revenge. He notes that this is a pretty good time to strike as Claudius is completely consumed by his prayer and doesn't even know that Hamlet is there. Unfortunately, he realises that if he kills Claudius while he is praying, in the purging of his soul, he will go to heaven rather than hell, where he belongs. So, unlike Claudius, Hamlet cannot just murder someone in cold blood. He is deeply conflicted between the ghost's command for him to take revenge and Christian morals which tell him that murder is bad. He decides he will wait until Claudius is in an act of sin, such as drunk asleep or in his rage or in the incestuous pleasure of his bed. Maybe it will be easier for him to kill Claudius then. In this way, Shakespeare contrasts the two men as examples of virtue and sin in perhaps one of the least ambiguous scenes of the play. But the scene is full of dramatic irony, which is where we know something the characters don't. Hamlet doesn't know that Claudius isn't even sorry and is therefore fair game. But if he had known it and killed him then and there, we wouldn't have much of a play, would we? While Shakespeare provides us with a relatively clear discussion of the nature of good and evil in some scenes, he goes further with a more nuanced look at the struggle between free will and the Christian belief in God's universal plan. Beware, things get pretty dark here. Throughout the play, 
Hamlet's personal struggle to determine his own course of action reflects our individual struggles between free will and religious determinism. Shakespeare asks us to consider to what extent we are in control of our own actions. In his first soliloquy in Act 1, Scene 3, Hamlet reveals the depth of his grief as he considers suicide. He emotively exclaims that he wishes the everlasting had not fixed his cannon against self-slaughter. In this moment, he is lamenting the fact that it was considered a sin to commit suicide as it is rejecting God's authority. This is reinforced in Act 3, Scene 1 when he asks the famous rhetorical question, to be or not to be. Here he is considering whether or not it is better to suffer or to take control and end his life. He poetically puts the case forward for suicide as a way of ending the heartache and the thousand natural shocks that flesh is heir to. Suffering is inevitable in life and beyond his control. But like he said before, he can't just end it all himself because religion taught that suicide was a sin. Thus, conscience does make cowards of us all. In other words, the belief that suicide is sinful prevents him from ending his suffering. Act 5, scene 1, picks up the thread of Hamlet's earlier arguments as we watch the awful drama that surrounds the burial of Ophelia, who has drowned herself in the river. Shakespeare uses the harsh language of the priest who explains that Ophelia's suicide is a great crime against God and that she should be remembered not with prayers. Instead, shards, flints and pebbles should be thrown on her and she should not be buried in a consecrated churchyard. In this way, Shakespeare continues his criticism of the institution of religion that governs individuals. As Ophelia's suicide is the result of the despicable way she has been used by Hamlet, Claudius, and even her own father, Polonius. She should be pitied, not condemned as a sinner. However, despite his tortured interrogation of religion, Hamlet finally comes to terms with his own fate being in the control of a higher being. When Horatio tries to warn him against dueling with Laertes, He answers that there's a special providence in the fall of a sparrow. This is an allusion or reference to a line from the Gospel of Matthew in the Bible, which explains that God is in control of the life and death of every creature, no matter how large or small. This is Shakespeare's hint that Hamlet has finally accepted that his fate is controlled by someone other than himself. This is reinforced in Horatio's eulogy for Hamlet in the final scene of the play. A eulogy is a speech in remembrance of someone who has died. His description of Hamlet as a noble heart indicates his inherent goodness, despite some of his bad behaviour during the play. Furthermore, Horatio uses religious imagery as he says, Flights of angels sing thee to thy rest. It seems as though Hamlet has gone to heaven after all, which is the ultimate reward for those who are pure of soul. So, by the end of the play, we can see that Shakespeare doesn't argue for one specific set of religious beliefs. Instead, he questions a number of different positions and asks us some pretty tricky questions about the nature of good and evil and the control we have over our own lives. We hope you enjoyed this Schooling Online production. For more easy lessons on Hamlet, check out our analysis of the theme of gender in the play.